This was such an appropriate song this morning and a, and a great reminder. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Because we have a promise today and every day that God never stops working on our behalf. He's always there, even when we can't see it. And I'm going to tell you, there are times in my own personal life where it's hard to see how he's working. I don't know if you've ever faced situations like this, but it's tough. But this song reminds us that even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it, he's working. He's not absent. There's never been a day since you've been a believer in Jesus Christ. Never been one day that you've gone through life alone and knowing that God is there with you, walking with you hand in hand. Even when you can't feel it. Even when you can't sense it. Even when you can't see it, He's there. And that's a promise that we can take to the bank. How much does God love me? He loves me enough to send Jesus Christ to die on a cross so that I could have a right standing relationship with Him and that He would never leave me nor forsake me. Bow your heads with me just for a few moments. Is there a situation in your life right now whether you're in this room, whether you're on the live stream, that you can't see how God's going to work it all out. Pour your heart out to the Lord right now and just say, God, I can't see it. I can't see the end of this story. But I want to trust you. As the father who brought his child before Jesus, and Jesus said, do you believe? And he said, help my unbelief. Maybe that's your prayer today. Lord, I believe, but I'm struggling. Help my unbelief. Help that part of me that's doubting that the light at the end of the tunnel is going to come. Father, you are a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, the light in the darkness. That is who you are. That is the God that we serve. Help us to remember that. I thank you for these two songs that we've sung today about standing on your promises and knowing that you are going to make a way where there seems to be no way. Father, I pray for each person here today. Maybe there's a situation in their life. Maybe they've had a diagnosis. Maybe they are dealing with financial burdens, relational burdens, whatever it is, work-related, if there's something that they are facing right now, help them to know that they are not alone and it's not left up to them or me or us, but that you will walk with us hand in hand and show us the way. Father, I ask you to be in our midst today. We invite you into this time, this time of worship, this time of teaching. And I just pray for hearts today who are hurting, struggling. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I will pray.
I don't know how many of you have driven around lately and realized that things are changing. The environment is changing. Just drive through the city and look at the trees, you know, and see how beautiful things are. You know, things change. I'm going to start a series over the next three or four weeks, and it's going to be called A Season of Change. Change is so hard on us so many times. Because change, especially in our world today, change is always around us and things are changing so quickly. Even if the change is good for us, even if we do end up liking the change, change is still difficult. I was thinking about this week, I had a couple of different illustrations, but this illustration came to me this week. Something that happened in this church probably seven years ago, um, and I, I wanted to use it. Um, and I just thought it was so funny. Many of you on a Sunday morning enjoy coming in to the church, and we have a coffee pot sitting downstairs, uh, and you can get a cup of coffee. Well, when we first started that, um, I knew there would be some challenges. I knew there would be people who probably wouldn't like the fact that we were serving coffee in the fellowship hall and the dining room and the foyer downstairs. Can you imagine someone really being not good with a change just at a coffee pot? But there were some folks who did not like the fact that we were serving coffee downstairs in the foyer, even before the foyer was renovated. One person in particular, I'm not going to use their name, it doesn't make any difference, was really vocal about us putting coffee, a coffee pot, we just put it in the, the corner downstairs in the foyer area. And one person in particular was really vocal and upset that we put that coffee pot downstairs in the foyer. It was change. They didn't really like that change. So fast forward a year later, we did it continue just put it in the corner and just let people get coffee as they wanted to get coffee and almost a year later there was a Sunday morning and I can't remember why we didn't have coffee in the foyer that morning I'm not sure if we had sip and chat I'm not sure whatever it was this person the same person who was upset a year before that we put coffee in the foyer was angry with me a year later that we didn't have coffee in the foyer. True story. Came to me going, where's the coffee? And I wanted to say, interesting. A year ago, you were mad at us for putting coffee in the foyer. And now you want to know where the coffee is in the foyer. My point is, is sometimes change is difficult for us, but it ends up being good. Sometimes change is good, you know, for us. We don't like it. I personally, I'm okay with some changes, but the more the change affects my routine, the harder it is for me. Seriously, think about that. The more the change, it changes your routine. I was thinking about this this week. How many of you love to go to Walmart right after they've made changes where things are. I mean, I don't know. You know, when, you, when there are changes happening in Walmart, I love to hear people go, I don't know where things are. I wish they would just leave things where they were. I mean, we all go through those times in our life where we don't like change. Even if it's good for us, we don't necessarily always like change. But the one thing that I'm learning in my life is change is necessary. Change in my spiritual life. You know, since I became a Christian, I've had to go through a lot of changes in my spiritual life and growth. And that change is necessary. Change is necessary in life. We are not all still going drinking out of a baby bottle and eating baby food. Right? We change is necessary. A baby begins with, you know, a, ba a bottle and some baby food, but then transitions eventually to solid food. Change is necessary, even if it's hard 
It is necessary. My dear friend David Easter says something, and I, this is really the premise of this series. And I, I asked him this week, I said, tell me again exactly how you said it. And he said it sort of this way. People who can adjust to change are the ones who can best make it in life. People who don't really go under, really struggle. You think about it. The people who best are able to change and adapt to change have the best life. Because the reality is there are those of us who like to fight change. I can remember even fighting change with technology. I love technology. But I remember back in the day, and I was thinking about this this week, I was thinking about what my first cell phone was a bag phone. Now, some of you who are younger may not even understand, you know, and I'm not talking about in a garbage bag or a Ziploc bag. That's not the bag phone I'm talking about. I am talking about a phone that was in a bag that had a battery that was probably three times the size of this phone that I carry. Um, and I'll never forget, I love my bag phone, and I had an external antenna that went on the top of the car. I love the reception that I got on that bag phone. And I got 35 minutes a month was all I could talk on that phone. 35 minutes a month. Some of y'all laughing because y'all were there. You had those phones. I loved my bag phone. And when they started talking about a phone that you could carry around with you, I did not like it because I wanted to keep my bag phone. You know, and here's the thing. I could carry my bag phone just like a purse. You know, it didn't only have to go in my car. I could unplug it, turn it up, uh, plug in an external. But some of y'all laughing. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. The rest, some of you younger people are going, what in the world? A bag phone? Even more than that, some of you, anybody else have a rotary phone? You know? Yeah, many of you had a rotary phone. Some of you younger people have no idea. If you walked up to a rotary phone, you'd be like, What's that? How do I dial? There's no buttons to push. You know, and you can't text on it either. Oh. But change is hard. Now I look back and I love the change. I love having an iPhone and all the, the technology that I have. But I resisted, even at a young age, I resisted that change from the bag phone, which I'm glad now I don't have to carry that bag phone around and I'm glad I have more than 35 minutes a month on my cell phone, uh, you know, and I could text and call or whatever. But, but change is so hard on us. And I've had to learn in my life, even though I'm, I'm just a little bit south of 50, getting closer to 50, um, I've had to learn to adapt to change. And I think, I mean, if we sat down in this room today, you guys could all talk about all the different changes you've had to adapt to. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But it's hard for us sometimes to actually change. If there's one thing that I have learned in my 48 years, almost 49 years on this earth, is that life is a revolving door of change. Life is a revolving door of change. Just the time I think I'm going to get comfortable with it, uh, you know, wham, something else changes in our world. And so how do we adapt to the changes that are happening around us? Because the reality is change is necessary. How many of you drove here in a car today? Okay. Most of you. How many of you drove here in a Model T car? Most, most people don't. You know, you think about, or how many of you came in a horse and buggy? You know, how many of you are glad we have indoor plumbing? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think about the changes. My first church, I was laughing about this this week. My first church was in St. Mary's, West Virginia. And um, it was a little tiny church. And they told me that I had my own, very own office. It was outside the church. What I didn't know was that it was the outhouse. That was my office. They were joking, but... Um, but the reality is we have, things have changed. But how have we, how are we adapting to change? 
in life. Even though that change can be good for us, change is necessary. I think what we have to learn is how to adapt to it. Many of the changes we've had in our life are designed or orchestrated by God for our good. Sometimes change is hard for us, but I think some of the changes that are happening in our life, God is orchestrating that for your good. You might not be able to see it. You might not be able to understand it. I might not be able to understand it. But it is for our good. There has never been a day, I've said this so many times standing in this pulpit, there has never been a day in your life, in my life, and since the creation of time, that God went, uh oh, I don't know how to solve that. Now, what are we going to do? You know, when the pandemic happened, we were all like, oh no, what are we going to do? God was like, I know what I'm going to do. I got a plan. So, change, God has a plan for the change in your life, in my life, if we will allow Him to do it. Sometimes we don't like it, we want things to remain the same. I'm going to start a series over the next few weeks, and it's going to come from the Old Testament book of Esther. And I've not really preached much on the life in the book of Esther. Um, So I had to really, over the past few weeks, really study hard to really get a hold of what this book was trying to say and share with us. So the book of Esther is in the Old Testament And the book of Esther is very similar to uh, the life of Joseph uh, in the Old Testament where Joseph really, all the changes that happened in his life, God used him to save the, the Jewish nation. Eventually, God put him in the right places through a lot of changes that happened in his life to save the Jewish nation. And the same thing is going to happen in the life of Esther. Esther um, and her family, uh, there's a lot of changes that are going to take place. Um, The Jews remained in Persia uh, after their captivity. Um, In this book, we're going to learn that there was an evil plot to get rid of the Jews. You know, there was always been people in this world, really since God created the earth, they wanted to get rid of any godly people. You know, they want to, you know we, we see that today. There's more persecution today happening in our world than probably in the history of humanity. There are people that want to get rid of the Christian people. And the same was true in this time period in the book of Esther. But what we learn in this book is that God always has a plan to combat evil in the world. Even though evil exists, even though we go through rough times, God still has a plan and wants to demonstrate his plan for us and to us. And so we find here in the book of Esther um, that we're go- Esther ends up being the hero or, uh, of this story. But she was in the place she was in, not by her own doing. Sometimes... The change that happens in our life, the changes that we have to are forced to make in life are not because of our own doing. A lot of times they're because of someone else's doing. We have no control over it. You think about the, the changes in your life and my life and how they have to, to come together and, and, and how they've been orchestrated. Most of the time we have very little control. Here's the thing I'm learning. Most of the time we have very little control of the changes that are happening in our life. Usually it's someone else's decision that affects your life and my life. So how do we handle it? That's very similar to what we're going to see in the book of Esther this morning. If you have your Bibles and want to turn with me to Esther, we're going to be in chapter 2. Let me lay out this really quickly. Um, The king here in this time period, he... um, he liked to, to have beautiful women be, be close to him, so he had wives, and then he wanted to brag and parade them in front of people and say, look at my beautiful prized possession. And in chapter 1, his wife refused to, to do that, and so he removed her 
as the queen. And so in chapter 2, the king needs to have another person to be the queen for him. And so he needs to have this. And so in chapter 2, we find that um, the, the, the king is looking for another bride, another woman. And he thinks it's going to be him selecting it. But what we, don't, what we learn in this story is that God has already selected Esther to be his queen for a reason. There is a purpose. So she is in a foreign land, and she is in captivity, and God is going to elevate her. Here's the other thing that's interesting to me. She is the most unlikely queen in that day because she was not a part of that country. You know, she wouldn't have been really someone that anybody would have really looked at or even considered, but God had a hand in that. God had his hand in that from the beginning. So if you want to read with me, I'm going to be in Esther chapter 2. I'm going to be reading verses 5 to 15 as we share together. Some of these words may be a little bit difficult, so if I butcher them, you can tell me later how to really say them. Um, I'm going to say them the best I can. Um, some of these names, but um, we'll, we'll work through it together. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jer, and the son of Shemai, and the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now you've heard, the, you probably have heard us talk about Nebuchadnezzar um, and you know, those kind of things. So that name we is fairly familiar. Um, among those taken into captivity was Jehokan, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, who he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. Now this Hadassah is really the Esther. So you think about the life of Esther. We're going to come back to this in just a few moments. And talk about all the changes that happened in the life in Esther's life. Number one, she was in a foreign land. Number two, her parents were gone, so she's raised by a cousin. You know, you, all these changes happened in the life of Esther. This young woman was named was known as Esther. Had a lovely figure and was beautiful. God, from the time she was created, I love. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament comes from Psalm 139, where it says, God knit us together in our mother's womb. There is a reason you are who you are and the way you are, because God made you that way. God doesn't make junk and God doesn't make mistakes. Sometimes we want to say to God, God, I wish I was taller. How many of you wish you were taller? You know, those of you who are short, but there's a reason. <coughs> excuse me, that God made you the way you are. And God, we see this in the story of Esther. Esther is going to be the hero, and she's going to help save the, the Jewish nation, but God had to make her beautiful, not so she could look in the mirror and say, look at me, but so that the king would, you know, see her as beautiful and select her to be the queen. So there was a reason the way she was it wasn't so she could pat herself on the back and you know look in the mirror and say you know who's the fairest of them all mirror mirror on the wall you know who's the most beautiful of them all that, that's not why god made her that way but god made her that way so that the king would select her uh, amongst a bunch of people and um you know he, he would select her to be the queen The thing that I think is interesting, and I'll say this now because I think it fits, the older I get in life and the changes that I've faced and the difficulties I've faced, the one thing is, remains consistent. It's I can see God's hand at work all throughout that time. You know, we're reading a story of Esther, and Esther probably couldn't see all the things that were going on in her life, but we can read about it now. I can say to you, I was just standing here in this sanctuary this week and I was praying and praying over this message and praying over different things. And I'm reminded, one of the things God reminded me of standing right here 
in this pulpit is that no matter what we have faced in our, what I faced in my life, I can see God's hand at work all throughout that time. And I can share with you today that no matter what you've gone through, no matter how difficult it is, you're going to get through it someday if you're going to be able to get through it. It's not always going to be this way. And the one thing is, is constant is God's hand has been at work in your life from the beginning of, the, of your relationship with Him. It is constant. And that's what we see here in this book. So the king gave an order. He wanted to bring all the most beautiful women together and um, wanted to bring them all together so he could, you know, preview them and select a new wife. So that's what this next section really talks about here in these verses. So when the king's order and edict been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge over the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned her to seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place. So all of a sudden, not only did God you know, share with her when he created her beauty. But obviously there was something special about Esther. He, she, you know, she must have been very, very special. And, and, you know, just that kind of person that you wanted to be around. Because she, you know, not only was her beauty, you know, she was beautiful, but I think that her personality was also beautiful. You know, I've seen some of the most beautiful people in the world and they open their mouth and they show how ugly they actually are. Sorry, that's just true. We all know people like that. Esther, I think, was the total package. She was not only beautiful, but she was also probably respectful, caring, whatever, and drew the attention of the person who was in charge. Verse 10 says, Esther had not revealed her nationality she basically kept her mouth shut uh, because her adopted father, let's say Mordecai, had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the countryside of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening with her. Every day he walked back and forth near the countryside and the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. That's verse 11. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Exorcise, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments, prescribed for the women six months of oil and myrrh and six months with perfume and cosmetics. So they, she had to be completely beautiful so that, you know, the king could select her. And then we learn on down in this passage, I'm just going to recap really quickly so I can get to the core of the message, is that eventually, you know, the king noticed Esther and her beauty and how amazing she was, and he selected her to be the queen. But the road getting there, the road to get to become the queen was not an easy road. The road to get where you and I want to be in life is never going to be easy. Brittany shared one of my favorite verses last week in John, I believe John 10, where it says, in this life, Jesus says, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. In this life, you're going to have difficulty. You're going to, you know, it's not going to be easy. And so the road for Esther was not easy. So I just sat back down this week and I began to look at what are the changes that happened in the life of Esther? First of all, she was raised in a foreign land. It wasn't her choice. She did, didn't have any choice of where she was going to be raised. Somebody else made that choice for her. She had to decide whether I'm going to just rebel against it or I'm going to accept it. Um, and I'm going, not going to allow it to shake my faith. Here's another thing that happens to us. And I am guilty of this at times. When change is so difficult and change is so hard and life is so hard, it is, it's, it's easy to lose our faith. 
It's easy to wonder where God is. It's easy to say, well, God obviously doesn't love me. You know, that's why I really drew back on the verse of that song earlier. Even when it doesn't feel like He's working, He's working. It's a reminder that He still loves me. Even when I can't feel it, even when I can't see it, even when I'm not experiencing it, He still loves me. And that's really what I want to share with you about the life of Esther. Another thing that wasn't her choice was that for some reason, I look, tried to figure this out, for some reason both of her parents were gone and she, could, she had to be raised by a cousin. She didn't have a choice in that. She didn't have a choice of that change. You know, that you know, mom and dad are gone and all of a sudden I have to be raised by a... Um, a cousin that that had to be hard i can't even imagine how difficult that would have been and then all of a sudden she was sent to be a part of the harem of the king so she did she had to leave her country she had to leave you know her mom and dad live with someone else and now all of a sudden she has another change happening where she has to go and live in this foreign area. And maybe she wanted to be beautiful, maybe she didn't, but she had to, to adjust to the change that happened. And she was said to be, you know, a part of the harem. That wasn't really her choice. She didn't say, you know, let me go on and sign up for that. Uh, we don't see that anywhere. Mordecai actually sends her. Makes me wonder if Mordecai didn't have some kind of inside information, you know, from God, you know, revelation from God. But all of a sudden, he, you know, she sent another change happens that wasn't really her choice. And then eventually, not by her choice, she ends up being chosen to be the queen. You know, I said this earlier, many times in our life, the change that happens in our life are not because of something we desire, but because someone else made that choice. And it affected me. And so how do I respond? That's the question. Change is necessary, but how do we respond? As I go back to what my dear friend David Easter said, people who can adjust to the change are the ones who can have the best or make the best in life. And the people who don't adjust to change, they end up going under. I know people in this life who refuse to accept change, refuse to accept things, and they end up going under. So how are we going to adapt? How are we as God's people going to adapt to the changes that happen to us? Folks, I love the beauty of this time of year, but I absolutely hate what's next. I despise winter. Two things I hate about winter are pumping gas and taking out the trash. Those are inevitable things. But I, those are the two things I hate about winter. But I recognize that if I'm going to live in this area, I've got to do the best I can to adapt to the winter conditions. I'm going to grumble a lot, probably. Every time I have to get gas and, you know, it's, you know, the sky's not sunny and the wind is, you know, howling through. You know, it never fails. The, time, the day you got to get gas in your car is the day that it's like 30 below zero and the wind chill factor is like negative 40. You know, and you're freezing, your hands are freezing, whatever. But how do we adapt? And I've had to learn in my 48 years of living in this area, I've had to learn to adapt to the weather changes. I just have to put more clothes on, more gloves. And the older I get, the more, I, more clothes I have to put on to stay warm. But I've had to learn to adapt to the changes. I think the same is true in our life that we need to learn to adapt to the changes. 
Because the reality is it might be tough. But some of the toughest changes that have happened in my life turned out for my good. Some of the toughest changes that have happened in my life turned out for my good. When my mom, I was thinking about this this week, I didn't understand why my mom went through a horrible time in the hospital and all the, the difficulties there losing my mom but I can tell you, I'm grateful for that experience today. Whenever there's a need at the hospital, I can't imagine not have gone through that situation. Because it has helped me to have more compassion and more understanding for people in the hospital. I didn't like the change. I didn't like what was going on. But I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for that experience. I'm not grateful that my mom's gone, but I'm grateful for the experience that I had. You know, I can't imagine if I would have been called to be a pastor and then not have had that experience. I wouldn't be someone who could go to the hospital and visit people or the funeral home when people lose a loved one. At 16 years or at 18 years old, I lost my mom. That was one of the most difficult changes I've ever made in my life. But because of that experience I had, I'm able to go comfort other people. So it worked out for good. I now get to spend the rest of my life with my mom when I die. That's the exciting thing. But so many times, the changes that we rebel against or whatever turn out for our good. Just like I shared with the, the stupid story of the gentleman in the coffee pot downstairs. I'll never forget that. He loved it once the, the you know, once it, he adapted to the change. But are we able to adapt? And maybe you're not going through any changes. You say, Chad, well, this is really a silly message. It, Folks, I'm going to tell you what. Life can change in the blink of an eye. Sad this week to hear about a plane crash right here in our area killing two pilots. So sad. When they left Columbus on when, Tuesday or Wednesday morning, their families thought, you know, they'll be back. Now their lives have changed forever. We never know how things are going to change. And I hope that we can hold, keep hold of our faith and stand on the promises of Almighty God no matter how things change in our life. Will you pray with me? Father, not all change is good but all change can be for our good if we'll allow it help us to hold on to you even when things change and usually Lord change happens dramatically we learn in the life of Esther that she obviously was willing to go through the changes and not rebel against it so, Father, I pray for each of us today. I ask you to help us to see your hand at work, to see the thread throughout our whole life. We would not be where we are today without your hand upon us. And I'm so grateful for that. I ask you, Lord God, if people are going through rough changes right now, that they would stand on the promises or maybe there's change going to come in this season I don't know but I know Lord God change happens and a lot of times it's for our good even though it doesn't feel like it so Father I pray 
that we can learn to adapt to change and trust you. The one thing that doesn't change is you, and I'm grateful for that. Just ask you to be in our midst this morning as we sing our final song. If there's something folks want to pray about, I'll be glad to pray with them. Maybe there's somebody that wants to make a change in their spiritual life. Say, you know, Chad, I've tried to do it on my own long enough. I want to make a change. Maybe somebody wants to join our church. Maybe that's a change they want to make. I don't know, Lord. Whatever decision someone needs to make, I'll stand out front and be glad to pray with them. I love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.